Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Brie Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you want to know what's coming next and vote on upcoming books, sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. You'll also find our new t-shirts in the shop, including podcast shirts and quote shirts from your favorite classic novels. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. You can find most of our links in the show notes. But also our website, biteatatimebooks.com, includes all of the links for our show, including to our Patreon to support the show, and YouTube, where we have special behind-the-narration of the episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear what inspired your favorite classic authors to write their novels— and what was going on in the world at the time, check out the Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Please note, while we try to keep the text as close to the original as possible, some words have been changed to honor the marginalized communities who've identified the words as harmful and to stay in alignment with Bite at a Time Books brand values. Today we'll be continuing Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Chapter 9 Elizabeth passed the chief of the night in her sister's room, and in the morning had the pleasure of being able to send a tolerable answer to the inquiries which she very early received from Mr. Bingley by a housemaid, and some time afterwards from the two elegant ladies who waited on his sisters. In spite of this amendment, however, she requested to have a note sent to Longbourn, desiring her mother to visit Jane and form her own judgment of her situation. The note was immediately dispatched and its contents is quickly complied with. Mrs. Bennet, accompanied by her two youngest girls, reached Netherfield soon after the family breakfast. Had she found Jane in any apparent danger, Mrs. Bennet would have been very miserable. But being satisfied on seeing her, that her illness was not alarming. She had no wish of her recovering immediately, as her restoration to health would probably remove her from Netherfield. She would not listen, therefore, to her daughter's proposal of being carried home, Neither did the apothecary, who arrived about the same time, think it at all advisable. After sitting a little while with Jane on Miss Bingley's appearance and invitation, the mother and three daughters all attended her into the breakfast parlor. Bingley met them with hopes that Mrs. Bennet had not found Miss Bennet worse than she expected. Indeed I have, sir, was her answer. She is a great deal too ill to be moved. Mr. Jones says we must not think of moving her. We must trespass a little longer on your kindness. Removed, cried Bingley. It must not be thought of. My sister, I am sure, will not hear of her removal. You may depend upon it, madam, said Miss Bingley with cold civility. That Miss Bennet shall receive every possible attention while she remains with us. Mrs. Bennet was profuse in her acknowledgments. I am sure, she added, if it was not for such good friends, I do not know what would become of her for she is very ill indeed and suffers a vast deal, though with the greatest patience in the world, which is always the way with her, for she has, without exception, the sweetest temper I ever met with. I often tell my other girls they are nothing to her. You have a sweet room here, Mr. Bingley, and a charming prospect over that gravel walk. I do not know a place in the country that is equal to Netherfield. You will not think of quitting in a hurry, I hope, though you have but a short lease." "'Whatever I do is done in a hurry,' replied he. "'And therefore, if I should resolve to quit Netherfield, "'I should probably be off in five minutes. "'At present, however, I consider myself as quite fixed here.' "'That is exactly what I should have supposed of you,' said Elizabeth. "'You begin to comprehend me, do you?' cried he, turning towards her. "'Oh, yes. I understand you perfectly. "'I wish I might take this for a compliment.' But to be so easily seen through, I'm afraid, is pitiful. That is, as it happens. It does not necessarily follow that a deep, intricate character is more or less esteemable than such a one as yours. Lizzie, cried her mother, remember where you are and do not run on in the wild manner that you are suffered to do at home. I did not know before, continued Bingley immediately, that you were a studier of character. It must be an amusing study. Yes, but intricate characters are the most amusing. They have at least that advantage. The country, said Darcy, can in general supply but few subjects for such a study. 
In a country neighborhood, you move in a very confined and unvarying society. But people themselves alter so much that there is something new to be observed in them forever. Yes, indeed, cried Mrs. Bennet, offended by his manner of mentioning a country neighborhood. I assure you, there is quite as much of that going on in the country as in town. Everybody was surprised, and Darcy, after looking at her for a moment, turned silently away. Mrs. Bennet, who fancied she had gained a complete victory over him, continued her triumph. I cannot see that London has any great advantage over the country for my part, except the shops and public places. The country is a vast deal pleasanter, is it not, Mr. Bingley? When I am in the country, he replied, I never wish to leave it. And when I'm in town, it is pretty much the same. They have each their advantages, and I can be equally happy in either. Aye, that is because you have the right disposition. But that gentleman, looking at Darcy, seemed to think the country was nothing at all. Indeed, Mama, you are mistaken, said Elizabeth, blushing for her mother. You quite mistook, Mr. Darcy. He only meant that there was not such a variety of people to be met with in the country as in town, which you must acknowledge to be true. Certainly, my dear, nobody said there were. But as to not meeting with many people in this neighborhood, I believe there are a few neighborhoods larger. I know we dine with four and twenty families. Nothing but concern for Elizabeth could enable Bingley to keep his countenance. His sister was less delicate and directed her eyes towards Mr. Darcy with a very expressive smile. Elizabeth, for the sake of saying something that might turn her mother's thoughts, now asked her if Charlotte Lucas had been at Longbourn since her coming away. Yes, she called yesterday with her father. What an agreeable man Sir William is, Mr. Bingley. Is not he? So much the man of fashion. So genteel and so easy. He has always something to say to everybody. That is my idea of good breeding. And those persons who fancy themselves very important and never open their mouths quite mistake the matter. Did Charlotte dine with you? No, she would go home. I fancy she wanted about the mince pies. For my part, Mr. Bingley, I always keep servants that can do their own work. My daughters are brought up differently, but everybody is to judge for themselves, and the Lucases are very good sort of girls, I assure you. It is a pity they are not handsome. Not that I think Charlotte so very plain, but that she is our particular friend. She seems a very pleasant young woman, said Bingley. Oh dear, yes, but you must own she is very plain. Lady Lucas herself has often said so and envied me Jane's beauty. I do not like to boast of my own child, but to be sure, Jane... One does not often see anybody better looking. It is what everybody says. I do not trust my own partiality. When she was only 15, there was a gentleman at my brother Gardner's in town so much in love with her that my sister-in-law was sure he would make her an offer before we came away. But however, he did not. Perhaps he thought her too young. However, he wrote some verses on her and very pretty they were. And so ended his affection, said Elizabeth impatiently. There has been many a one, I fancy, overcome in the same way. I wonder who first discovered the efficacy of poetry in driving away love. I've been used to consider poetry as the food of love, said Darcy. Of a fine, stout, healthy love it may. Everything nourishes what is strong already. But if it be only a slight, thin sort of inclination, I'm convinced that one good sonnet will starve it entirely away. Darcy only smiled. And the general pause which ensued made Elizabeth tremble lest her mother should be exposing herself again. She longed to speak, but could think of nothing to say. And after a short silence, Mrs. Bennet began repeating her thanks to Mr. Bingley for his kindness to Jane, with an apology for troubling him also with Lizzie. Mr. Bingley was unaffectedly civil in his answer, and forced his younger sister to be civil also, and say what the occasion required. She performed her part, indeed, without much graciousness. But Mrs. Bennet was satisfied and soon afterwards ordered her carriage. Upon the signal, the youngest of her daughters put herself forward. The two girls had been whispering to each other during the whole visit, and the result of it was that the youngest should tax Mr. Bingley with having promised on his first coming into the country to give a ball at Netherfield. Lydia was a stout, well-grown girl of fifteen, with a fine complexion and good-humored countenance, a favorite with her mother, whose affection had brought her into public at an early age. She had high animal spirits and a sort of natural consequence, which the attentions of the officers to whom her uncle's good dinners and her own easy manners recommended her, 
had increased into assurance. She was very equal, therefore, to address Mr. Bingley on the subject of the ball, and abruptly reminded him of his promise, adding that it would be the most shameful thing in the world if he did not keep it. His answer to this sudden attack was delightful to her mother's ear. I am perfectly ready, I assure you, to keep my engagement, and when your sister is recovered, you shall, if you please, name the very day of the ball. But you would not wish to be dancing while she is ill. Lydia declared herself satisfied. Oh, yes, it would be much better to wait till Jane was well, and by that time, most likely Captain Carter would be at Maryton again. And when you have given your ball, she added, I shall insist on their giving one also. I shall tell Colonel Forster it would be quite a shame if he does not. Mrs. Bennet and her daughters then departed, and Elizabeth returned instantly to Jane, leaving her own and her relation's behavior to the remarks of the two ladies and Mr. Darcy, the latter of whom, however, could not be prevailed on to join in their censure of her, in spite of all Miss Bingley's witticisms on fine eyes. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today, while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. Again, my name is Brie Carlyle, and I hope you come back tomorrow for the next bite of Pride and Prejudice. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com and check out the shop. You can check out the show notes or our website, biteatatimebooks.com, for the rest of the links for our show. We'd love to hear from you on social media as well.